This is Ham College, episode 15 from March 31st, 2016. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM and the innovative new IC7300. And by hamstudy.org, a great place to study for your amateur license exam. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Tommy. I'm George. <laughs> <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> We've only done that about, what, 150 times? Um, n- no. 15. No. For Ham College. Up. For Ham College. Oh, yeah. We've done it a number of times. Yes, that's right. I'm in my official... Um, prison uniform well i was i was thinking it was a football outfit oh old i school? just don't have my leather helmet to go with oh it. there you go that, that's mm-hmm. a lot better than the prison yeah well we've got a exciting show tonight and a subject that um, really i haven't worked with in in quite some time yeah me either but it's it's interesting i remember having a lot of fun with it when we first got our tickets oh yeah big, and uh, big I, times I, yeah i've actually thought about kind of getting into it a little bit again and doing some segments on it but for amateur logic yeah well what are we going to talk about satellites satellites okay well just to mention here before we go on We've got a chat room whenever we're streaming live. It's at amateurlogic.tv slash chat. Come join us over there if you're watching live right now. Uh, We can't really monitor the YouTube chat room at the same time, so um, join us at this one right here. Last month we talked about propagation. Remember that? I do remember that. That was an interesting show. Yeah, that's a tough topic, too. You know who that is? No, I have no idea. That, my friend, is Arthur C. Clarke. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, This is our history lesson for the month, by the way, on satellite communications. The idea for satellite communications can be traced all the way back to this guy, uh, back to February of 1945, where Arthur C. Clarke wrote a letter to the editor of a magazine called Wireless World. In his paper, Mr. Clarke laid out his theory on satellite communications. His paper was titled, Extraterrestrial Relays Can Rocket Stations Give Worldwide Radio Coverage? It was published in the magazine in, in uh, October of 1945. Boy, that is, uh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I didn't either. That's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. Apparently, he's a pretty sharp guy. Apparently so. Uh, he kind of had the idea before the rest of us. Well, the first artificial satellite, and I guess anything that circles the globe would be considered a satellite. Yeah. Uh, right. But uh, the, the first artificial one was called Sputnik. Mm-hmm. And it really wasn't put up by us. It was uh, put up by the Russians uh, or the Soviet Union in October of 1957. They had a transmitter on board that transmitted on two frequencies. One of them was 20.005 megahertz, and the other was 40.002 megahertz. That satellite was an early step in the space race, and it was uh, not really used to uh, relay communications. I, I would have thought it was, but uh, according to this paper you wrote up here, yeah. it wasn't. Yeah, no, it wasn't. It's just, uh, I guess, sent out the beacon on there. Um, but anyway, it was kind of the first step in, in the space race with the Russians, you remember? Yeah, that kind of got us that. fired up over here, didn't it? Yeah, it did. <laughs> well, the the first American satellite that actually did relay communications was called Project SCORE. That was in 1958. It used a tape recorder to store and forward messages. It was used, actually used to send a Christmas greeting to the world from President Dwight D. Eisenhower. This is the President of the United States speaking. Through the marvels of scientific advance, 
My voice is coming to you from a satellite circling in outer space. My message is a simple one. Through this unique means, I convey to you and to all mankind America's wish for peace on earth and goodwill toward men everywhere. He sounds like a professional broadcaster, so like a president, doesn't it's he? It's like Don Wilbanks, a professional pronosticator. A pronosticator. Yeah. <laughs> he did. He didn't sound like a president to me. Yeah. He could have been reading. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was. <laughs> Somebody probably wrote it for him. Well, uh, beginning with the Mars Exploration Rovers, probes on the surface of Mars have used orbiting spacecraft as communication satellites for transmitting their data to Earth. The orbiters are suitable for this purpose since they are much closer to the Mars landers than the antennas on Earth. While they are more powerful transmitters and large antennas enable them to transmit data to Earth much faster than the landers could have on their own. Yeah, I, I wasn't really aware of that either. I, I thought that was pretty interesting. If you think about it, I mean, he, the little rover can't have much of an antenna. So True, it's yeah. going to relay off the satellite, which is closer, which could pick mm -hmm. up the weaker signal from it and then beam it back to us. Yes, that's, that's a very good idea. Yeah, I thought it was pretty awesome. I didn't, I never really thought much about that. Yeah. But uh, now comes the fun part, satellite orbits. Communications satellites usually have one of three primary orbit types, but there, there are a lot more than just three. Um, anyway, their classifications are used to specify their details. Geostationary satellites, they have an orbit of about 22,236 miles from the surface of the Earth. While they do move, they move with the rotation of the Earth, so it makes it appear that it's in the same position of the sky at any given time. That means you can put your antenna in a fixed position, sort of like your direct TV dish. Yeah, uh, all video satellites, and, and, mm -hmm. and what people normally think of as satellites are geostationary. Mm -hmm. While they do move, they move with the they, rotation of the they Earth. Move. Well, they do, they, but they're also going in little circles at the same time. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yep. And don't ask me how I know that. I just remember that from years ago working uh, with some satellites at a radio station that that was a factor. Huh, that they're constantly sitting there moving a little bit. Interesting. I'm going to have to look that up. And that's all I got to say about that. Okay. That's your story and you're sticking with it? Yep. Moving right along. Medium Earth Orbit, or MEO. The MEO satellite's orbit is from 1,243 miles to 22,236 miles above the Earth's surface. They're constantly rotating around the Earth. So you don't, you can't use a fixed antenna for that. You're going to have to have a A&L so you'll have rotor to, and, and know when it's going to cross if you're your, using, line of, your, your path there. If you're using a directional antenna, you'll have to mm -hmm. kind of track the satellite. Right. And the other one that's uh, primary for uh, communication satellites is Low Earth Orbit, or LEO. The orbit for these satellites are from 99 to 1,243 miles above the Earth's surface. Most communication satellites are of this type, including most of our amateur radio satellites. Low yeah. Earth Orbit satellites are much less expensive to get into orbit and require, require a lot less output power since it's much closer to the ground. Yeah. Most amateur radio satellites get the designation OSCAR, which stands for Orbiting Satellite Carrying Amateur Radio. There are several up there, including the International Space Station, which I've uh, seen some of the APRS packets coming down from that mm -hmm. one on the handy talk, using the handy talkie before. I think there's, um, right now we've got somewhere around 14 or 15 amateur satellites up there. Yeah. A great organization for amateur radio satellites is AMSAT. That's uh, spelled A-M-S-A-T. In 1969, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation was formed in Washington, D.C. as an educational organization. Its goal was to foster amateur radio's participation in space research and communications. AMSAT was founded to continue that work. They started all the way back in 1961. Project Oscar was their first one. A West Coast-based U.S. group built and launched it 
It was the very first amateur radio satellite. On December 12, 1961, barely four years after the launch of Russia's first Sputnik. Today, the homebrew flavor of these early radio satellites lives on, and most of the hardware and software are flying now on even the most advanced AMSAT satellites are still largely the product of volunteer efforts and donated resources. AMSAT's designs and technology continue to push the envelope. They're working on a couple of special projects mm -hmm. now that I, I haven't heard anything on recently where they stand, but AMSAT is hoping to launch a higher Earth orbit satellite uh, called Eagle. Oh, cool. That would be cool if we had a, so that would be geostationary. Oh. You know, when you were saying uh, that the amateurs got into the game just four years after Sputnik went up, it, didn't, it doesn't take amateurs very long to spring into action on the good stuff. No, they were pretty, pretty quick. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. I thought yeah. I thought it was. Uh, Cube sets are currently becoming very popular with amateurs and with schools. A Cube sat's a type of miniaturized satellite for space research that's made up of multiples of small cubic units. Cube sets have a mass of no more than 1.33 kilograms per unit. They often use commercial off-the-shelf components for their electronics and structure. And CubeSats are most commonly put into orbit by deployers on the International Space Station or they're launched as a secondary on a launch vehicle. And those, you see a lot of uh, activity on CubeSats these days, and it's not just amateurs, you know. There's yeah, yeah, apparently it's pretty, uh, must be pretty inexpensive to get those up there. I was reading some stuff about uh, some of the homebrew satellites, how a lot of off-the-shelf Things were made to, to assemble them, and they went actually went to Radio Shack and bought a bunch of solar panels mm -hmm. to power the, to, to recharge the batteries on the things with. So then they, they brought them all, tested them all, and kept the ones that had the higher output, and then returned a whole bunch of them back to the Radio Shack <laughs> store when they were finished with them. Oh, or, wow. you, you know, the ones that didn't quite meet the meet, make the cut. So I thought huh. it was kind of neat. So there there's another. Um, type of orbit you talked about geostationary satellites uh, medium earth orbit low earth orbit yeah there were there were tons and tons of them. we'd be yeah. reading that stuff all night if we read all that uh, there, there were several well there's another called near earth orbit mm -hmm. you familiar with that one i've heard of it i but... think you may have a, a picture there of uh some near earth orbit that's balloons oh oh yeah 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 you know, those are real popular now uh, yeah, a lot of amateurs and uh, in association with schools or, or launching balloons. Yeah, uh, Buddy Bill, close by here, they were doing that for a good while. I don't, I don't think they're doing it anymore, yeah. but uh, you know, we so covered a few of them. Yeah, we've got um, some of that on some earlier episodes of Amateur Logic. Yeah, and there's some guys in the Facebook group that are apparently they're actively doing this stuff right now. So mm -hmm. I've seen them post, uh, post about it, and uh, I've been following a few of them on uh, APRS.fi. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty amazing how far those things would go. Some of them went all the way over, like to Scotland. If you wanted to to hear the International Space Station, you know they they've got amateur communications on there. You were telling me earlier that they don't do voice on there very often. Yeah, well, I I read they don't turn that on very often, but primarily they have a packet station up there where they send APRS or I guess mm -hmm. they got a digipeter on there. If you want to see if you can hear it, uh, tune in on your, well, you don't need much. You could listen with one of these right here, just a handy talkie. Yep, yeah, sure can. 145.8 megahertz, and you could possibly hear the International Space Station when it passes over. Yeah, now you're going to have to go, uh, look there's several up. resources yeah. online that you can track it. There are even some apps for your phone that you can track when it comes over. Mm -hmm. You remember when uh, we first got licensed and we're, like experimenting with like everything and we tried uh, i think it was the mir space station at the mm -hmm. time and then uh i believe it, if our memory is right which is probably not i think ao21 was one of the satellites that came over that had i believe it had packet on it but uh anyway we we've tried those yeah um, we had a lot of fun with them we actually did yeah did some good with them so, yeah uh, a rubber duck you can uh you can actually work yeah. it with a rubber duck homemade quarter wave works works really well this would be a typical setup here for working satellites he's got a uh, i don't know if you call that dual polarity 
Or yeah. if they call that no, I circle. I call it an arrow antenna. Circularly uh, polarized. So I noticed two different polarizations mm -hmm. there on it. But uh, he's just using a handy talkie, and he's got a little Yagi antenna on it there. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of people using those to work satellites, so it doesn't take a big, powerful station. Yeah, they they used to do that at uh, Jackson Hamfest mm -hmm. uh, for a while. I don't think they've done it in the last few years. But yeah, you a lot of uh, Hamfest will have satellite demonstrations mm -hmm. there, and that's essentially what they're using to do it with. Uh, you, like we said, you can actually hear some of the satellites with just a, a handy talkie and a rubber duck on it. If you're gonna try, well, if you're really serious about it, you're gonna going to get some better antennas, some Yaggies or something. Some people will stack more than one together to increase mm -hmm. the gain. If you're just going to try to listen on what you've got, though, don't use your 18-foot tall uh, high-gain fiberglass 2-meter antenna to do it with. Use uh, something very plain like a, a short little quarter-wave ground plane mm -hmm. because on those, the uh, angle of radiation is so much greater you're more likely to hear a satellite when you go with a high gain antenna what they're doing is narrowing down the beam width of it right so the satellite when it gets right over you you're not going to hear it yeah it's pretty in a null pretty yep. much we're, we're not real big satellite guys these days we don't don't operate it as much as many folks that's their primary mode of, mm -hmm. of operating ham radio so there's a, a lot more on the subject that you could learn by doing some searching on the internet or yeah. check with some local clubs. Yeah. You'll find somebody who's really into it and can steer you the right direction if you want to get into satellites. Yeah. You remember our buddy uh, George too? Yeah. NC5Y. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was really big into it. It was a lot of fun to go by there and learn from him. Yep. Well, I'll tell you what, before we uh, get on into the rest of the show here, let's take a little break and then we'll come back and we'll give away something. All right. The wait is over. The IC7300 is here. ICOM's new innovative HF transceiver will far exceed your expectations for a radio considered entry level. The 7300's RF direct sampling system is an industry first. It departs from the conventional superheterodyne system. RF signals are directly converted to digital data. Digitizing the RF before various receiver stages reduces inherent noise generated from different IF stages. A large 4.3-inch color touchscreen promotes intuitive operation and functions like the waterfall, which displays high-level performance in resolution, sweep speed, and dynamic range. The audioscope function allows you to observe various audio frequency, transmit, and receive characteristics. And a high-resolution real-time spectrum scope includes a new magnify function. Other great IC7300 features include RMDR and superior phase noise characteristics, 15 discrete bandpass filters, and more. Visit icomamerica.com amateur and learn more about the new ICOM IC7300. We said we were going to give away something. Let's, how about if we give away one of these uh, cool ICOM caps and an ICOM ham crew t-shirt? Okay, why don't so we do that? Whoever yeah. whoever wins this is going to be looking just as good as the last guy last month that won one, too. Yeah, if you'd like to win one, then all you need to do is send us an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. You could win one, and, and as okay. usual, we haven't drawn a winning entry yet, so so yeah, I'll do that right now. Yeah, business as usual. Tommy, N5ZNO is the winner. No. Nope. That wasn't it? No, nope. our winner, and I've got one okay, here. Okay, we got it. This comes um, from Johnny R. He says, I'd like to be entered into next month's Episode 15 for the ICOM t-shirt and hat. Also, thanks for the videos and other sources. I'll be taking my technician test tomorrow, and I know I'll pass. Awesome. And, wow, he sent this today. Really? Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Way to go. So, um... Good luck, Johnny. I'm, yeah. I'm sure you'll do well. Yeah. Just send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. And you could win. Okay, Tommy, I got a question here just for you. All right. It's got your name on it. Maybe I can see it. And the questions tonight are going to be 
believe it or not, on amateur satellite communications. No. Yeah. It seems to be a running theme. Yep. So how much transmitter power should be used on the uplink frequency of an amateur satellite or space station? A, the maximum power of your transmitter. B, the minimum amount of power needed to complete the contact. C, no more than half the rating of your linear amplifier. Or D, never more than one watt. Okay, so I'm going to go already scratch D off right now because... Uh, Never more than one watt. That's the, some most cases. That's probably not going to cut it. Yeah, and what if you don't have a linear amplifier? Yep. Never C. So that's that actually going to rule C out. Uh, B. The minimum amount of power needed to complete the contact. Well, that's that's the general rule for communications on pretty much anything. On we, amateur radio. On amateur yeah. radio. So we've mm -hmm. covered that a lot. And A is the maximum power of your transmitter so that's uh that's while well, some people think that's the minimum amount of power well it is when you're mobile when you're mobile according to our elmer yeah so but uh <laughs> i'm going with b on that one the minimum amount of power needed to complete the contact which is like we said is the general rule on amateur radio period across the board yeah i think you're right everybody in the chat room does too There you go. The minimum amount of power needed to complete the contact. I nailed it. All right, you ready for your question? Yeah. All right. Hit me with your best shot. <laughs> okay. Which of the following are provided by satellite tracking programs? A, maps showing the real-time position of the satellite track over the Earth. B, the time, azimuth, and elevation of the start, maximum altitude, and end of pass. C, the apparent frequency of the satellite transmission, including effects of Doppler shift. Or D, all of these answers are correct. Hmm. Which are the provided uh, satellite tracking program? You know, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. But I'm just going to go out on a limb here because all of those things sound like things that a satellite tracking program would have on them. Or should. I'm going to just say D. I'm just going to take a stab at it. Uh, it looks like that's what the folks over in the chat room are saying there. So let's see how we came out on that one. Cool. Next question here. Which amateur station may make contact with an amateur station on the International Space Station using 2 meters and 70 centimeter amateur radio frequencies. A, only members of amateur radio clubs at NASA facilities. B, any member, I'm sorry, any amateur holding a technician or higher class license. C, only the astronauts' family members who are hams. <laughs> D, you cannot talk to the International Space Station on amateur radio frequencies. And this one's mine, so I know D is incorrect. I just know it. C, only the astronaut's family members who are hams. That's just not even, wouldn't even be worth making a rule for the few, few, many, yeah. few people that that probably is. A, or B, any, member, any amateur, I keep wanting to say member, I can't see that very well. Any amateur holding a technician or higher class license? Well, I think that's going to be your answer because it says 2 meters and 70 centimeters, and uh, that's generally the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the class, the lower class license that has permissions there. A, only members of the amateur radio club. I'm, I'm going with B, bravo. Yep. Nailed it. Chalk up one more for Team Tommy. Chalk it up. <laughs> Okay, next question. What is a satellite beacon? And that doesn't say bacon. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you don't have when you don't have some of these at work at that distance, it could be bacon. So, what is a satellite beacon? A, the primary transmit antenna on the satellite. B, an indicator light that shows where to point your antenna. C, a reflective surface on the satellite. 
or D, a transmission from a space station that contains information about a satellite. All right, this one's mine to answer here. Well, let's see, the primary transmit antenna. No, antenna's not called a beacon. Uh, a light on top of an antenna could be called a beacon. Could be. Yep. Uh, B, an indicator light that shows. No, it's not an indicator light. C, a reflective surface on the satellite. No, you're not going to see the satellites reflecting standing down here on Earth. D, a transmission from a space station that contains information about a satellite. That's going to be your answer. That's what everyone is saying over yeah. here in the chat room. I'm going to go with that. And there we go. That, a beacon, when we're talking amateur radio terms, it, you know, a beacon is a flashing light on a tower. Mm -hmm. But in amateur radio terms, we're talking about a beacon. We're talking about a transmitter that's just sitting there broadcasting a message over and mm -hmm. over. It Not doesn't listen at all. Back. Yeah. So there you go. But what is the, a satellite? Kevin beacon? in the chat room says bacon's better. Bacon does taste better. Yeah. Beacons are usually tasteless. <laughs> we'll be back in just a minute for with some more questions, but first take a look at this. Are you new to the ham world? or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level, study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. Hamstudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbeam, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org powered by ICOM for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. Let's get on back into a few more questions here. All right. And the first one, which of the following are inputs to a satellite tracking program? A, the weight of the satellite. B, the Keplerian elements. I'm sure I butchered that up. I'm glad you got that to read that. C, the last observed time of zero Doppler shift. D, all of these answers are correct. Whose okay. turn is it? It's your turn. My turn? Okay. Yeah. I'll pick this one out especially uh, for you. D, all these answers are not correct. C, the last observed time. Well, why would you put that in the satellite tracking program? And the weight of the satellite is totally irrelevant for the satellite tracking program. And I just so happen to have run satellite tracking program before, so I know it's B. But the others don't make any sense either, so... So you're saying it's B. I'm saying it's B. So you're saying there's a chance. Yep. You got it. All right. Team Z and O. The Keplerian elements. There you go. Or however you pronounce that word. Yeah, just like that. Yeah. You can download those off the Internet. and um, You can get them, yeah. That AMSET we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. uh, you can get them from there. There's several different sources to get them, but that's a good place. Cool. 
All right, more satellite questions. With regard to satellite communications, what is Doppler shift? A, a change in the satellite orbit. B, a mode where the satellite receives signals on one band and transmit on another. C, an observed change in signal frequency caused by relative motion between the satellite and the Earth station. And D, a special digital communications mode for some satellites. And I think we talked about Doppler shift here recently. We did. We, we might have even talked about it in the last episode. Uh, did we? It was we very talked about recent. it, yeah, about an hour ago in the paper that you have in your hand over there. Mm -hmm. It was in here. Oh yeah, that, it was very no, recent. No, no, well, no. We <laughs> in a recent episode, not not this one. Oh, okay. So I know the answer to that. Um, it's not the uh, special digital communications mode for satellites. It's not a a change in the satellite orbit. It's not B a mode where the satellite receives signals on one band and transmits on another. It's C an observed change in signal frequency caused by relative motion between the satellite and the Earth station. And you know, we talked about that. We were talking about a, uh, a train horn recently. Yeah, what? oh yeah, we sure did. We yep. sure did. Now you say that, I remember that. So so there we go, it is C. You know, as, as a train is approaching, you hear one pitch of horn, and as it passes by you, that frequency drops. Yeah, that's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Same thing happens at radio frequencies. Yeah. That, is, that is real interesting. It's really kind of a pain, too, if you're trying to work the satellite. Yeah. And you know how, how best to handle that? There, there's, if you can get to the VFO easily on your radio, you can mm -hmm. turn it as you go. If not, then you program in the memories of your radio a bunch of frequencies right side by side, and you could just step through those memory presets as it goes. Yeah, or you uh, have your nice software in your A&L beam and the software that's controlling your radio mm -hmm. follow it as it goes across the horizon. And you're going to create that next month with a Raspberry Pi? Is that <laughs> yeah, and two coat hangers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question here. What is meant by the statement that a satellite is operating in mode UV. A, a satellite uplink is in the 15 meter band and the downlink is in the 10 meter band. B, the satellite uplink is in the 70 centimeter band and the downlink, downlink is in the 2 meter band. B, the satellite operates using ultraviolet frequencies. <laughs> D, the satellite frequencies are usually variable. UV, usually variable. <laughs> I don't oh, think that's. I don't know. I just don't think that's going to be it. I'm not really familiar with that term, no. And I don't think it's in ultraviolet frequencies either. So I'm going to go ahead and scratch out C and D right there off the bat. Okay. And uh, satellite uplink is in 15 meter band. I was, it's going to be B. Bravo. The satellite link is in the uplink is in the 70 centimeter band, which would be the U since that's UHF. And the downlink is in the two meter band, which is the V, which is in VHF. Well, everybody in the chat room is saying B, except for the few who said E. And of course, E is not a choice. So yeah. I'm going to go with you. There we go. B, the satellite uplink is in the 70 centimeter band, and the downlink is in the two meter band. Yeah, there's not too many that work in the ultraviolet range. Yeah, and I don't know of any that really work in the 15 and 10 meter bands. Not a um, not a low Earth orbit, a uh, near Earth orbit. You might have some HF frequencies on those. Yeah, but uh, and that would be a balloon. Like Jocelyn in the chat room said, if it were 15 meters, that would be one big antenna up there on that thing. That would be. Yeah. Yeah. What causes spin fading when referring to satellite signals? A, circular polarized noise interference radiated from the sun. B, rotation of the satellite and its antenna. C, Doppler shift of the received signal. Or D, interfering signals within the satellite uplink band. And E, I'm glad this one is yours. Okay. Oh, I think I got a hunch I know which one it may be. What causes 
been fading when referring to satellite signals. A circular polarized noise interference radiated from the sun. No. Um, when we've got interference radiated from the sun interfering with a satellite, that's normally a sunspot. Mm -hmm. Sunspots, but um, which flare? Yeah. B, the rotation of the satellite and its antenna. That's that's going to be it because the satellite is sitting there spinning. Do you know why it's sitting there spinning? To maintain its polarization. To keep from uh, burning out the solar cells, keep them from getting too hot. Ah. Yep. C, Doppler shift or the receive signal. No, that's not it. And D, interfering signals within the satellite uplink band. No, nope, it's B, rotation of the satellite and its antennas. And that's what they were all saying over in the chat room. So, bam, there you go, B. You nailed it, man. Yep. Way to go. Okay. No buzzer yet. No buzzer yet. What's up uh, with that? I don't know, man. We're just um, lucky. <laughs> <laughs> all right, one more here. What do the initials LEO, L-E-O, tell you about an amateur satellite. A, the satellite battery is in low energy operational mode. B, the satellite is performing a lunar ejection orbit maneuver. Man. C, the satellite is in a low Earth orbit. Or D, the satellite uses light emitting optics. Now this isn't really fair for me to to answer this one because I know the answer because I sat there and I did all this research for the mm -hmm. history lesson. So I already know that the answer is going to be uh, low Earth orbit C. But uh, the others, D doesn't really make any sense. Light emitting optics. No. Lunar ejection orbit maneuver. That sounds plausible. Not really. Yeah, I've never known the lunar to eject yet. No. So. <laughs> Some of these things they come up with on here are pretty funny. Yeah. What is a commonly used method of sending signals to and from a digital satellite? A, USB AFSK. B, PSK31. C, FM packet. Or D, WSJT. Well... I know the answer to this one just because I know it. Because you've done it? Because I've done it. And this was primarily one of the very few ways that you could communicate with a satellite back when we first started doing it mm -hmm. uh, back in the 30s. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Back, back in the 90s. I'm still a youngster. Yeah, it's C, FM packet. Um, packet radio where you use a TNC with the radio and uh, usually a computer. That's always broadcast over FM. Uh, if you think about it a little harder, you know, we were talking earlier about you can use a handy talkie to receive satellites. I haven't seen a, any two meter or UHF handy talkies that have USB on them. Uh, they don't have PSK-31 on them. They don't have a WSJT. All of these operate on FM. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that tells me one thing. It's FM because um, that's most 2-meter and UHF radios operate on FM. You can operate uh, other modes, upper sideband and lower sideband with them, but typically they always do FM. Uh, so that's my answer, and I'm sticking with it, whether it's uh, All right. good logic or not. There you go. Everybody in the chat room was saying that it's C as well. So. Yeah. It's, uh, yep. Next question. What is the FCC Part 97 definition of telemetry? It's A, an information bulletin issued by the FCC. B, a one-way transmission to initiate, modify, or terminate functions of a device at a distance. C, a one-way transmission of measurements at a distance from the measuring instrument. D, 
an information bulletin from a VEC. Okay, so this one's mine, and telemetry is not in any way related to a VEC, so let's go ahead and take D off the list right now. Okay, I'll agree. Okay, and let's just start from the top. An information bulletin issued by the FCC, same, same thing. No, it's not telemetry. A one-way transmission to initiate, modify, or terminate functions a device. A one-way transmission of measurements at a distance. I'm going with C. Telemetry is, uh, in my mind, is a packet of data that's sent out from over the air to read uh, the, basically the status, the voltage, and, or whatever. And it's of one it's way. Coming from one way. Yeah, it's not expecting anything yeah, in return. So I don't. I don't th yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll agree with you. Yeah. Okay. One-way transmission of measurements at a distance from the measuring instrument. Now, this wasn't specifically a satellite question, but it's related to satellites. Mm -hmm. and that's well, they, they do send out some telemetry. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but it's not exclusive to satellites. Yeah. Other right. uh, telemetry could come from, from any source. But telemetry would be like uh, metering or measurements or something like that that you're receiving. Mm -hmm. Some uh, interesting stuff came from those balloons we were talking about that Bill used to... Mm -hmm. Set off over here at the school. Remember the telemetry? Yep. You could follow that stuff. Had the position, the out, the altitude, how fast it was traveling. Yeah, yeah temperature, the voltage mm -hmm. of the batteries on there, everything. It was, it was pretty neat stuff. Mm -hmm. What is the FCC Part 97 definition of telecommand? A, an instruction bulletin issued by the FCC. B, a one-way radio transmission of measurements at a distance from the measuring instrument. C, a one-way transmission to initiate, modify, or terminate functions of a device at a distance. Or D, an instruction from a VEC. It's almost like deja vu. Yeah, it is, except it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So... What is the FCC Part 97 definition of telecommand? An instruction bulletin issued by the FCC? No. And I don't know why they would even keep keep coming back to the FCC there. I'm, I'm thinking they, they think you would mistake this for a telegram. <laughs> but no, it's telecommand. So it's not a... B, a one-way radio transmission of measurements at a distance from the measuring instrument? No. That was telemetry. We just determined that. Yep. It's not D, an instruction from a VEC. Pretty much narrows it down, doesn't it? Narrows it down to C. A one-way transmission to initiate, modify, or terminate functions of a device at a distance. Man, you really had to put the thinking cap on for this one, didn't you? Boy, I swear I did. <laughs> was that the last question? Yep. Oh, wow. Thanks for being here. Another fun show tonight. And we'll see you again next yep. time. 73, everybody. 73. I just noticed uh, Mike told Arnie that I'm wearing my uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou costume. Dang, you're in a tight spot. Boy, I am. <laughs> I really am. Yes, yeah, well, I, I've been mistaken for being George Clooney many times. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. I could see where that would be a problem. Again, we're talking about satellite communications tonight. Uh, well, actually. <laughs> okay. Maybe we're not. May you just aim your dish once, and then you can keep it there. And did you know the battery's running down on that camera? I need to go plug it in. AMSAT was founded to, you know, 
I think I just need to do that part all over again because of, <laughs> because of my, my phrasing on it just uh, was, was totally incorrect. Do we want to wait till the train passes or? We probably should. I'm sure y'all hear that.